Thank you. Um, greetings from Madison. Every day is beautiful in Madison. It wasn't foggy there today. And every sunset in Madison is quite gorgeous. And our view of reality in Madison is quite skewed. <laughs> and our t-shirts remind us we don't take things very seriously. What I'd like to do today is cover some areas about nicotine dependence in people with mental health and addictive disorders. I'm going to be talking about disproportionate smoking rates among people with mental health and addictive disorders, understanding additive morbidity and mortality, discussing barriers in our field, and understanding concurrent treatment needs. For some of you in the audience, like Ron, for Merrill, I hope this is an affirmation and supports and enhances what you do. For others in the audience, this may be a very uncomfortable topic. It may cause, as we say now, some cognitive dissonance because of our field's very unique and some say disturbing relationship with tobacco use in the people we treat. Before I go on, as Gary mentioned, I'm part of the WinTIP project. I do want to thank my colleagues. Without their help and assistance, today's presentation wouldn't be possible, and a lot of it is drawn from the work that they have done. I always start out with the obligatory slide, smoking rates in the United States. This shows the trends of smoking in the general population over the past 50 years. And back in 1964, when about 50% of the adult population smoked before the Surgeon General made the announcement that smoking causes cancer, smoking was pretty much a socially accepted behavior. But when Luther Terry made that announcement, smoking rates started to plummet in this country and have continued to do so, with significant drops in the early 1970s after tobacco advertising was banned on television, and has continued to decline. As you can see, now with general adult smoking rates, I think now in Wisconsin around 19 to 20 percent, smoking rates have almost halved due to massive public health efforts, treatment efforts over the past 50 years. Remarkable public health success. Yet when we look at these numbers, and particularly as you look at the right side of that graph, things have started to level off. And over the past 10 years, some of us who've looked behind those numbers saw some very disquieting trends. We started to realize that not everyone was benefiting equally. Not everyone was sharing in this success that not everyone had smoking rates that had declined over the past 50 years. In essence, what we were learning is that tobacco is not an equal opportunity killer. The addiction affects the most vulnerable in our society now, those with the least information about the health risks, those with the fewest resources to, to resist tobacco advertising, which is around $10 million per day worldwide, and those with the least access to cessation services. It's not an equal opportunity killer. And in tobacco control, people use the term tobacco use disparities. People who are disproportionately affected by tobacco. And who are we talking about? Who are the people behind those curves? We're talking about ethnic minorities who smoke at greater rates than the general population. People with low socioeconomic status, lower educational levels, pregnant women, youth and young adults, 
In the largest group, people with coexisting mental health and addictive disorders. And frankly, individuals with coexisting mental health disorders diffuse all the above disparate groups. In pregnant women, major depressive disorder is the most important variable to smoking in 50% of pregnant women. In youth and young adults, mental health and addictive disorders drive smoking in well over half of those individuals. Mental health and addictive disorders is the greatest disparate group. And when we look at specific percentages, to give you an idea, some representative diagnoses, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, panic disorder, PTSD, name an axis one diagnosis, we can give a figure. Smoking rates are two to three, sometimes four times the general population. You want one that's not up there, ADHD, 50%. One one that's not up there, alcohol dependence, 80%. General population rates, 20%. And what's interesting, general population rates includes people with mental health and addictive disorders. So that 19% is an inflated rate. And while national epidemiological studies have found that 22% of adults have a psychiatric disorder, they consume 45% of all cigarettes smoked in this country. Again, a highly disproportionate use of tobacco products. And what else have we learned when we look behind those numbers? We learned that there was a linear, a distinct linear relationship between smoking and psychiatric diagnoses. In other words, if you had no psychiatric diagnosis, the chance of smoking was the general population rate. Just having one psychiatric diagnosis raised the risk of smoking up to about 25%, which then continued with increasing number of diagnoses. And with more diagnoses, the increased risk of being a heavy smoker, which is greater than one pack per day by most traditional definitions. A linear relationship between smoking in psychiatric diagnoses. We also found in a study that we did in 2006 that heavy smokers compared to light and non-smokers had poor overall well-being on structured instruments, greater functional impairment, and more severe depression and anxiety. In other words, we found that smoking is a severity of illness multiplier. In other words, smoking identified the sickest patients in our clinic who were coming in for mental health problems compared to those who did not smoke. A parallel to what is found in all medical clinics when smokers are looked at compared to non-smokers. And what does this mean to our patients? What does this mean? Well, there are additive mortality risks. Heart disease is seven times higher than their peers and more than seven times the suicide rate. Smoking influences the development of metabolic syndrome in patients on antipsychotic drugs. And as we all know, metabolic syndrome increases the risk for cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes. And the average loss of life is 24 years. For a smoker without a mental health and addictive disorder, the average loss of life is 12 years. So for the people we treat, it is doubled. The average loss of life, 24 years. As I say, most of the patients that I treat, if I don't address their nicotine dependence, they will probably die from that, not from the primary disorder that I'm treating. Not from their major depression, not from their bipolar disorder but from their nicotine dependence if I do nothing. Well, let's shift a little bit. Let's go to the real world. Let me give you a case. This is a prototypical example. We'll use this to identify some different concerns and barriers in our field. John's a 24-year-old law student transferring to psychiatric care for depression, just to any old mental health clinic. He went off fluoxetine several months ago due to sexual side effects. That was not his t-shirt. During the ensuing months, his depression returned. He's now having problems in multiple areas. He has sporadic class attendance and is barely keeping up with his work. 
His ability to care for himself has suffered. Depression rating scales in the severe range. Alcohol use is minimal to none. So, usual care in the majority of mental health clinics in this state, in this country, is John is treated for his depression and does well. That is usual care. John is not identified as a daily smoker in usual care. There's no plan, no intervention, no identification for the addiction that will likely kill him, as we've just heard. Why is this usual care? If John had walked into any other part of the medical system, this would not have happened. To any other medical clinic, this would not be usual care. But in our field, it is. And it is because there are extreme and unique barriers that I'm going to talk about. Barriers such as, well, treating nicotine dependence is not within the scope of my practice. It's never been defined as a responsibility. And I'm not sure how it relates to my scope of practice. It's not my job mentality. We hear this a lot when we talk to clinicians about this topic. And what has this led to in mental health? Well, psychiatrists, when we look at their records, we find they identify and document smoking status in about 35% of the patients they see, compared to a national average for primary care physicians of 65%. Child psychiatrists, well, they're worse, 14%. Psychologists, from a study we did, 20%. In inpatient settings, 1%. So if it's not in my scope of practice, rarely done. And what does this mean? It means treatment is neglected, and studies have shown this. Our patients rarely receive cessation counseling because of this. Even when they go to primary care, they may be identified, but only 38% receive cessation counseling, and only 12% if they see psychiatrists. A unique barrier in our field. What would enhanced care be? Enhanced care, a step above usual care. To me, that would be formalized identification, smoking history, and action taken. So, in this case, John would be identified as a daily smoker. He smokes one pack per day. He smoked for about seven years and made two or three unaided quit attempts. His longest abstinence is two to three weeks before relapse, and he notes an increase in his depression leads to relapse. His first cigarette is upon awakening, so he is advised to quit. That's formal identification, smoking history, and action. What are the barriers to that happening in our field? We hear this a lot. My patients don't want to quit. They have more pressing matters. They rarely ask for help. And what do we know about that? Well, actually those are myths. 75% of current smokers with mental health and addictive disorders express desires to quit. 65% in studies, 65% of our patients in studies have tried to quit in the past year. In a study by Prochaska, patients in an outpatient treatment for depression, 79% intended to quit. And in a study by Siru in 2009, where he looked at 14 studies looking at motivation to quit in people with mental health and addictive disorders, the motivation consistently matched the general population. So what do we need to do to enhance care in our field? We need to use some form of the classic five A's. The five A's themselves is ask, advise, assess, assist, arrange, 
or the American Academy of Family Practice, the Ask and Act, or the Ask, Advise, Refer, or New Zealand, the ABC, Ask Brief Intervention, Brief Intervention Cessation Treatment, doing something. And it needs to be formalized in the health record and integrated into treatment planning, as it is in any other medical setting. And what happens when you do that? Well, in medical settings where there's no screening system, as you can see, the intervention rate is 38%. When you put it in screening system, as I said before, you go up to 65% identification. And what does that do to cessation rates? It doubles cessation rates just by asking someone, are they a smoker? Double smoking rates just by asking someone that they're a smoker. And when you advise them to quit, you get an almost 3% rise in abstinence by just doing that. So enhancing care can help the people we take care of. Never Never Land. Let's go to Never Never Land. That's optimal care. Optimal care is integrated and tailored, tailored treatment. What do we mean by that? Well, in John's case, that would be evaluating the status of a psychiatric disorder. So there would be symptom management, like with psychotherapy, antidepressant medications. There would be development of a nicotine dependence treatment plan with individual or group counseling, possibly a quit line, nicotine dependence pharmacotherapy, and most importantly, a follow-up that promotes wellness with remission from depression and it supports his abstinence from tobacco. That would be optimal care in this case. But again, there are barriers to optimal care in our field. One that we hear, treating tobacco dependence would threaten progress in the more important areas I treat. I can't risk the stability of his wellness or recovery. If I ask him to quit tobacco, he may get depressed. It may affect everything else I do. Treatment rarely works. Why should I even try? These are the things we hear. What do we know about this? I think you get the idea of what I'm going to do next, right? Okay. <laughs> More myth busters. What do we know about quitting and worsening of mental health and addictive disorders? Quite frankly, there's little evidence to support worsening in general. Little evidence to support worsening in general. And particularly for depression, as in John's case, Studies have shown there's no worsening of depression with cigarette abstinence when depression is appropriately treated. In treatment outcome research, the 24 studies that have been published with a variety of psychiatric disorders have found that quit rates are slightly lower but similar to the general population. The people we treat can be successful and particularly those with depression, relevant to John's case. A recent meta-analysis found that short-term and long-term abstinence rates were the same for people who had a history of depression or who did not. The people we treat can quit and can be successful in their efforts. So some real-world follow-up from John. After four weeks of treatment with an antidepressant, he cut back from one pack per day to five cigarettes per day. He was interested in continuing his quit attempt. He also wanted to start an exercise program to assist in that. And at a three-month follow-up, his depression was in remission. He had been abstinent from cigarettes for two months. He would used nicotine replacement therapy for those two months, and now was just using it as needed, nicotine gum. And he felt his mood stabilization played a large role in allowing him to quit. As we move on, I've talked a lot about some very specific barriers relevant to this case. What I'd like to do before we move to solutions is talk about some of the fundamental barriers and challenges that really can't be ignored. So I want to insert them in here. This is such a difficult problem in our field because there are neurobiological factors that reinforce the use of nicotine in the patients that we see. Patients using nicotine, to offset side effects and medications, shared genetic vulnerabilities that enhance the
the degree of nicotine dependence in the patients we treat. Many of the persons we treat feel excluded from mainstream cessation programs. This is not to bang on people in tobacco control, but most programs aren't set up for people with mental health and addictive disorders. Most of the literature is not written for the people we treat. Can you imagine somebody going into a routine smoking cessation group with severe PTSD and starting when they, you know, talking about their PTSD in that group? It would be like, whoa, it's not going to work. So most of your patients, they'll go and they'll say, yeah, it's just not going to work for me. I didn't feel right. It didn't address what my problems are. There has to be a shift in that. Our patients have lower rates of quit attempts, most of the time because we're not supporting it or they don't feel they have the support to quit. And they have higher relapse rates, oftentimes because treatment isn't there for them. And we need to really address some of the systems barriers and challenges that are quite, quite large. Lack of resources. We're all struggling with that. And asking people to do more with less is a huge, huge challenge. Many states around this country, there's lack of reimbursement if nicotine dependence treatment services are provided. Until recently in Wisconsin, substance abuse counselors couldn't bill for nicotine dependence treatment. There's little regulatory oversight that would promote these best practices. In other words, JCO doesn't come in and look at smoking cessation identification in mental health clinics. They go to primary care and look at it. That's what pushes this in primary care. That push isn't there for us right now. There are a few incentives to promote best practices. I don't see any programs except for one, but you don't see it. Advertising say, we're smoke free. Come to us. In New York, when they tried that before they made their entire substance abuse treatment system smoke free, other programs said, You can smoke, come to us. <laughs> <laughs> There's few incentives to promote best practices right now. And most importantly, our culture in mental health and addictive disorders, we're nicotine dependent ourselves. Dr. Heiligenstein, um, we're a little short staffed today. Uh, can you send the patients out for a smoking break so we can kind of get things in order on the unit here, please? Um, you know, Bill, if you don't settle down, you're not going to get your cigarette ration for the day. Programs are nicotine dependent themselves. And we have to address how we dissociate ourselves. Smoking breaks? Why do we call them smoking breaks? Why not wellness breaks? Think about how we've accultured ourselves with tobacco. This is where we are, I think, in our field. We've got a major fork in the road. And I would propose that we must expand the definition of mental health treatment to include the treatment of comorbid nicotine dependence that often accompanies psychiatric and substance use disorders. So for the last part of my talk, what I'd like to do is talk about clinical, things you can do as individuals, system, ideas you can take back for where you work, and comprehensive solutions, the WinTIP program. Clinical solutions, what can you do as individuals? Things to keep in mind. Traditional cessation treatments for the people we treat may be inadequate. What we're learning is what's written for people without mental health and addictive disorders doesn't always work for the people we treat. One of the most prominent examples, typically, right, if you open up the American Cancer um, <coughs> Society, American Lung Association, quit plans, set a quit date. Throw out everything in your house that has to do with cigarettes. Well, for some people, that works. For the majority of the people we treat, that is enough to stop them from even trying. There has to be flexibility in the quit date for many of the people we treat. And oftentimes, reduce smoking to reach abstinence. You talk to people in tobacco control about reduced smoking, it's, it, it's like, you know, ah. It's, it's considered, you know, forbidden fruit. You can't do that. But again, for the people we treat, an incredibly important way to tailor their treatment to be successful. 
And as, as I've used that word, combination and tailored treatments, both behavioral and medical, are critical. We have to be aware of nicotine drug interactions. Our patients are often on multiple medications. And smoking induces one of the enzymes in the liver that metabolizes many of these medications, different antipsychotics, different antidepressants. And stopping smoking can cause rapid and significant increases in blood levels. So patients have to be monitored during smoking cessation for side effects and changes in effectiveness of the medication. Yeah. Doubles the clearance. Well, a typical example of that is what does it mean when it doubles the clearance? Um, when Zyprexa olanzapine first came out and people were being switched to that medication for, let's say, um, schizophrenia, they would be put on the medication and the standard dose wouldn't work. And so people would slowly increase the dose until they reached effectiveness. And if most typically those patients were people who were smoking two, three, four cigarettes, packs of cigarettes per day. Well, if they had to get admitted to the hospital and this unit was smoke free, they would stop smoking. And their blood levels would skyrocket because the nicotine would be taken away from the cigarettes. And it's not the nicotine, I'm sorry, the cigarettes would be taken away, and it's not the nicotine per se, it's the, the tars and the other things in cigarette smoke that induce the liver enzymes. So their Zyprexa would be, have to be lowered very rapidly, very quickly because of awful side effects. And they'd be discharged, they'd start smoking again, and their blood levels would drop. <laughs> so there was a seesaw effect. So Awareness of nicotine drug interactions is critical and working with a person's prescriber is, is very, very important. Other treatment principles that have to be kept in mind, all smokers trying to quit should receive pharmacotherapy, even though the US practice guidelines does not recommend pharmacotherapy for light smokers. Most of the people we treat probably will need some form of pharmacotherapy because of the difficulty they have in quitting and how it interfaces with their co-occurring disorder. The dose level and duration of drug treatment is often individualized. Again, how it meshes with their co-occurring disorder. I have people who have been on smoking cessation medications for years because that's what they need, not six months like they're supposed to be on. And many will need higher doses of medication. As I mentioned, longer duration in combination treatments. And the first line pharmacotherapies can be successfully used, such as the nicotine replacement therapies, bupropion, which is Zyban or Welbutrin, and varenicline, which is Chantix. Behavioral toxicity in pharmacotherapy for nicotine dependence always comes up when we look at this area. And as you may have heard, bupropion and varenicline have a slight risk for suicide and suicide attempts. The odds ratios are there, 1.12 or 1.17, and for suicidal ideation, 1.2, 1.43. Very small, but it's there. Untreated nicotine withdrawal can cause adverse behavioral changes, including suicidal ideation. So all of our patients have to be informed of this potential when treatment is discussed. But this is a traditional risk versus benefit equation because half of all smokers who don't stop by middle age will die of a tobacco-related disease. To me, it's not a reason to prescribe less. It's a reason to monitor more. What are some of the system solutions? What do you need to take back to where you work? We have to acknowledge the challenge, acknowledge this cultural shift that has to take place in our field. Most systems that have addressed this and changed have created tobacco initiative committees. They have started with easy system changes. They've rev reviewed and revised their policies. 
with Wisconsin going smoke-free in July of 2010. Yeah. I can't take credit for that, but it's an opportunity for system change because smoke-free can then be tobacco-free. It's an opportunity right there to look at your policies because that will affect all of us and where we work. <coughs> system solutions can be incorporating tobacco issues in the patient education, staff training about treatment of nicotine dependence, and support and pharmacotherapy to both patients and staff who may be nicotine dependent. Those are system solutions that have worked in other places around the country and in this state where system change can take place. Lastly, I'd like to talk about comprehensive solutions. This is the Wisconsin Nicotine Integration Project. Our website is listed there, which has continuous updates, information, videos, podcasts, all those little techie things that are just wonderful everything you wanted to know about all of this. Our WinTIP mission statement, saving Wisconsin lives by integrating evidence-based nicotine dependence treatment into alcohol and other drug dependence and mental health services. As you can see from our posters, I didn't survive depression and suicide attempts only to die from lung cancer. I had to stop smoking. I didn't go through treatment, get clean and recovery from drug addiction so I could die from lung cancer. I had to stop smoking. It's a cultural change. It's a way of thinking that's very different. In some ways, yes, it's an education of the head. In other ways, though, it's an education of the heart. It's a way of rethinking how we've done things. WinTIP is a multi-year planning project for integration. We're in our second year right now. It's currently funded by the Wisconsin Division of Public Health Tobacco Prevention and Control Program. And it brings together tobacco control, mental health, substance use, and government systems for the first time ever to look at addressing this problem in the people we treat. It took us years, it took us years to get the tobacco control program, and this is nothing against them, but to illustrate how far off the radar the people we treat were. It took us years to bring awareness that we were a disparate group. We would joke to them, you have to realize we're the disparity of the disparities. And that shifted things. We were finally able to be seen as a disparate group in tobacco control. This started to be pulling. We start, were able to start pull this together. We have representative stakeholders on this slide here. We have multiple, multiple stakeholders throughout the state who are aware of our project and support our project. Many member organizations that you probably belong to as I mentioned, the Tobacco Control Program, SCAOTA, Wisconsin Psychiatric Association, Wisconsin Psychological Association, social work organizations, counseling organizations, Division of Mental Health Substance Abuse Services, dozens of different organizations that if I put them all on one slide, you wouldn't be able to see anything. So I just put a few here who are in support and are helping us with this project. And our strategic policy considerations Policies and procedures for maintaining tobacco-free environments. Personnel policies for the provision of treatment for staff who are dependent on nicotine. And state guidelines for addressing and integrating nicotine into addiction and mental health services. Some of the things we're looking at. How has this been done in other states? How can we do this here? In other states, for example, in New York, their substance abuse system is a separate entity, the OASIS system. They went smoke-free last year, tobacco-free. 
where nicotine dependence treatment is basically written into their policies as a must do. Colorado is doing some integration. New Jersey has integrated into their residential treatment programs. So we're looking at different states and what they've done, trying to take some of the best practices and bringing it back to us. So the Wintip formula is buy-in, training, resources to get successful implementation. The Wintip 2010 needs your help. And that's why it's a privilege for me to stand up here and talk to you because I need your help. Our primary 2010 WinTIP goal will be to inform as many Wisconsin clinicians about the need and benefit of providing tobacco dependence treatment to all the patients, clients that you see. We need your help. Basically, how do we talk to everybody? Specific websites, listservs, newsletters for brief articles, organizations to contract, conferences for booth presentations. It's a Herculean task in some ways to try to find everybody who's out there. We need your help. My contact information is on the handout. Send us ways that you think we can connect with people. If your organization has a newsletter, let us know. We'd be happy to submit something. If your organization has a listserv, let us know. We'd like to submit something. Our conferences that your organization has, let us know. We want to connect with people. Other ways that you can help. Talk with your peers about this pressing health issue. Ask your patients and clients about their tobacco status and desire to quit. Seek more information and have information material on hand for your patients. Also on your handouts, there's resource materials, the Smoking Cessation Leadership Center out of the University of California, San Francisco has tons of information, including toolkits that you can download and use. UWC Tree also has information and toolkits. So in closing the deal, mental health providers are the ideal persons to deliver smoking cessation care. We have a therapeutic alliance with our patients and clients. They will return for us for care. So repeated quit attempts can be encouraged. And it's cost effective because these are planned visits. We're the ideal persons to do this. So in conclusion, the most important barrier of all the barriers that I identified and talked about, the most important barrier for us to overcome is the internalized belief that our patients and clients cannot or will not quit, rather than looking at how we can help them do so. And the most important component of all of this is a sincere belief in the right of this population to receive the same level of health care assessment and treatment in regard to the use of nicotine that is the expectation for the general population. Thank you very much, and we do have time for questions.